now, on behalf of all of us here on One, this is Roger Moore wishing you a very good night. Good night. It's almost unthinkable in this day and age, but back in the day, TV used to go to bed at the same time as its viewers. Generally, they'd show a clock, give a continuity announcement, command the viewers to turn off their sets, lest they explode, and play the national anthem, generally over their own logo, or over pictures of the Queen doing stuff, or on occasion just a single ghoulish still picture of the Queen staring into the viewers' eyes and minds like some ancient spectre. And then they just switch off for the night, go black. But as the world grew increasingly connected and fast-paced, as distances shrank between major settlements, as the stock exchanges became the centre of the universe, blank screens, even at two o'clock in the morning, became more and more troubling, until finally reaching lemon grab levels of unacceptability. Breakfast had already been conquered. It was time for television to join the dots. Here comes the night. It was actually Channel 4, then very much still the bad boys of British TV, who first experimented with late night broadcasting in this country. At the time that just meant staying up well past one in the morning, much to the irritation of the ITV techies who had to play out their adverts. By the mid 80s, with the eventual success of commercial breakfast television, broadcasters began to grow hungry. They started looking for other potential untapped markets. The daytime, and the night time. The daylight hours soon fell into the deadeningly bland pattern where it stayed to this day. Programming so insubstantial it's not really worth coming up with anything resembling special branding for it. It would have been like trying to gift wrap water vapour. ITV's sole attempt at such a brand was very much after the horse had bolted and no one really noticed or cared. The night however was different. Unlike the daytime, it wasn't hampered by the watershed, but on the other hand, there was no obvious audience to aim at either. Frankly, no one knew what was going to happen, or what could even be shown there. There was even talk of the IBA franchising the post-midnight hours, just as they had the hours between 6 and 9.30, creating a whole new station for the purpose. TV PM, if you like. Or... T TV AM, T TV more AM than the other TV, you know what I mean. But that idea was never going to work. It would have been patently impossible for a TV station to make a profit on nighttime hours alone. So instead it was left for the regions to experiment how they saw fit. And the first station, the first station in the country in fact, to go 24 hours on a regular basis was Yorkshire. And now Mighty B we rock our way through the night with the top video entertainment from the Mighty Music Box. And so without further ado, let's now, now join Timmy Mallet. <laughs> They struck a deal with Thorn EMI to simulcast their incorrect answer to MTV, Music Box, over the night. This was in August 1986. Sky had only just got started. Satellite broadcasting was still a relatively new technology. Terribly exciting and slightly frightening to the average viewer. Thorn EMI were planning to use the platform to become a broadcasting superpower. A plan whose success is best measured by the fact that there is no EMI anymore and no one can remember what Thorn even was in the first place. Ultimately, Yorkshire would only get five months of use out of Music Box before Thorny MI gave up altogether and closed it down. It was later revived by Richard Branson, but that's neither here nor there. But Yorkshire were now committed to nighttime broadcasting, so instead they extended Job Finder, a sort of 
DHSS pages from CFAX. Also dipping their toes into post-midnight waters around the same time were Central, who sometimes stayed up till well past three in the morning with more Central. A step up from either of Yorkshire's efforts in that it was an actual television service featuring programmes and everything, and even continuity, all played out by the company itself. On Central teenage Susan George meets not-so-teenage Charles Bronson. She's twinky. When this failed to fail, other regions were emboldened and soon everyone was doing it. Apart from the smaller regions who couldn't afford to, but who cares about them? Thames let the sun set on their famous skyline. Their weekend rivals went LWT through to six. And Granada started staying up all night, albeit only at the weekends for a while. Let's not go nuts here. The most notable development of all, however, was TVS's creation of Late Night Late. Hi, how you doing? Welcome along to Monday's Late Night Late. Thank you so much. A show with a weirdly tautological name and a title sequence far too brash for that hour of the night. Late Night Late was important for a few reasons. The first was the format. InVision continuity was one thing, and most of these early attempts at late night broadcasting consisted of just that. Although given the time slot, it often felt like eerie dystopian horror about a purgatory for continuity announcers, with increasingly red-eyed presenters visibly losing their bonhomie as the hours dragged on. So anyway, that was one thing, but Late Night Late took it a step further. This was a full-on presentation strand with letters, phone-ins and competitions. It was a bit like the children's BBC broom cupboard for adults. As a format, it didn't really catch on. The only other company to do something similar was HTV, with their nightclub, which launched just under a year later. But the light-hearted tone certainly did strike a chord with the motley collection of insomniacs, unemployables and angry loners who tuned in. Perhaps more importantly, Late Night Late was the first such strand to be broadcast on another ITV station, specifically Channel, for whom Puffin's Place tended to stretch the budget a bit. The first concerted group effort at a nighttime strand, however, was Night Network which launched almost simultaneously with Late Night Late. Night Network was produced mostly by LWT and initially served them, TVS and Anglia on LWT's nights, i.e. Friday, Saturday and Sunday do keep up. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it was created and run by one of the producers of Channel 4's The Tube, and aimed largely at the same audience, with presenters such as Tim Westwood, Barbie Wilde, Roland Rivron, Emma Freud, and um, Nicholas Parsons. If Late Night Late was the broom cupboard, this was going live. Before long, it had been adopted in ITV regions up and down the country. Not all of them. Central turned their noses up in favour of carrying on with more, and Granada had their own plans for the smaller regions, which we'll see in due course. But that wasn't the point. The point was that Night Network was a success. It proved there was an audience. It proved that late night broadcasting could be viable. And anyone who didn't adopt some kind of nighttime provision was now officially a behind the times loser. So 1988 saw loads of new ITV nighttime strands being launched. The first was in May and it was in Yorkshire, although it wasn't really a strand at first. Yorkshire just didn't close down. Eventually it was cordoned off and christened through the night. Their late schedule was fairly standard in that it consisted of imports, movies, 
and uh, this massive bell end. HTV's nightclub followed in August, and then in September, Granada created perhaps the one really iconic late night strand. Night Time, to give it its rather simplistic title, was provided by Granada's presentation department in Manchester, and as well as serving Granada itself, it was networked to the smaller regions, initially Border, Tynetes, Grampian, and my region TSW. Ulster arrived fashionably later, months later. Most of those regions had been picking up night network at the weekends. Granada's new service overrode that which may have contributed to Night Network's relatively early demise. The look and feel of the Granada nighttime service was, for whatever reason, explicitly sinister, even haunting, with its mascot a silhouetted cat inscrutably staring out at the screen amid much Sabatier effect, chroma key laid atop chroma key, and an ominous monolithic logo. The music was an off-the-shelf library piece by the late Steve Gray, called Unseen Danger. It had already been heard on the likes of The Professionals, The Sweeney, and just about every Australian soap opera ever made, for those occasions when someone's slowly approaching an unsuspecting main character down a darkly lit corridor, clutching a knife. I need some information. On what? B. Smith. And the combination of feline inscrutability, skeletal piano, and eerily detached continuity announcements, because they'd been recorded the previous day, made late nights in the six regions to carry this service decidedly spooky. Not that it was all ambient jazz and existential musings. There were attempts at wackiness. <laughs> You will watch night time. He's got a TV control. And he's not afraid to use it. But it's in the middle of the afternoon. Quiet. Ow. Night time. Or edginess in a deaf to kind of way. Today, the television medium has become so powerful. Night, night time, night time. Night, night, night time. This television medium. Night time. Reaches them by the millions. Night the overall time. effect was eerie, disjointed, and hard to get a grip on. Almost as if you'd already fallen asleep and were dreaming. I don't know if that was the effect they were going for. There was the odd concession to the conventions of normal hours television. They had a Christmas ident. A merry dance of love, now on night time, between a bricklayer, a pizza baker, and a flower vendor. It's jealousy, Italian style. Technically, it's a Granada Christmas ident, with the ice sculpture nighttime logo replacing the arrowed G. But then nighttime was just Granada after hours, shared out among five other regions who couldn't afford to do it themselves. Although, having said that, there was nothing stopping them from asserting their own identities, as TSW did. This is TSW Nighttime. This is something I don't think any of the other regions did. Create and deploy their own ident and presentation on top of Granada's actual programming schedule. So TSW could have a late night service provided by another company at little cost to themselves and still assert their own branding over the top of it. It's quite ingenious. Although I think they stopped bothering after they lost the franchise. Of the three franchises serving Scotland, Granada's nighttime service accounted for two of them. The main ones, Scottish, were too proud and too rich to brook the notion of some English channel coming in and doing their programming for them, even in the middle of the night. Although, of course, they hadn't been in 1987, when they put together a deal with Central and Granada to put together a joint schedule for 24-hour broadcasting under their own names. That died on its ass within a few months, leading to Granada creating nighttime and Scottish eventually initiating through the night. 
I know, we've heard that one already. There are only a few potential names you can give to this sort of thing, after all. Even Channel 4, the pioneers, got in on the act, creating their own short-lived nighttime strand in the late 80s, with its typically avant-garde spelling matched by its presentation, which actually managed to outdo Granada's for sheer spookiness. The next nighttime service to come along was, irritatingly enough, called ITV Nighttime, further illustrating the lack of truly original names for this thing. This one came from London. There was a joint venture between Thames on the weekdays and LWT at weekends, with the main difference being that LWT were too tight to spring for overnight continuity announcements making the Friday to Sunday shifts particularly eerie, lacking as they did any human voices whatsoever. Though pieced together and transmitted from London, it also played in the HTV region, where it replaced Nightclub, and eventually TVS and Anglia too. The presentation was neon motorways and acid jazz, rather than an age of chance and vaguely menacing ambient, and so was rather more pleasant in the conventional sense, although that vocoded Night time. Probably got very old very fast. ITV Nighttime from London proved to be a very popular and well regarded service. So, as is usually the case with these things, it didn't last long. It started in April 1991. Just six months later, Thames lost the franchise. ITV Nighttime ultimately died with them after only 20 months on air. Their successors, Carlton, showed no particular interest in carrying it on, and so it was quickly consigned to the history books. HTV and Anglia, left out in the cold, took up night time from Manchester, which just left LWT, who carried on where they left off, under a new name, Three Nights. <laughs> Despite brazenly using the ITV logo, Three Nights was strictly LWT flying solo. It lasted a few vaguely unsettling and again almost entirely voiceless years before being sacrificed on the altar of public apathy. Carlton, for their part, created their own nighttime strand in tandem with fellow 1993 newbies Meridian, although they didn't quite call it a nighttime strand. Now it's time for our movie, The Day the Earth Caught Fire. Nighttime, using the same quirky spelling as Channel 4, ran from the genesis of both channels on New Year's Day 1993 throughout the first couple of years of their existence, between them covering the entire south of England, except London at the weekends, as well as the Channel Islands. That it was noticeably cheaper and more perfunctory than the previous service was only to be expected, really. It was all change up north, too. For the first time, franchisees could buy or merge with each other instead of just using each other's programmes. Night Shift, starting in 1992, was the fruit of the second merger between Yorkshire and Tyne Tees. Glorying in the fact that they now ran two regions, Yorkshire, because why pretend they weren't the senior partners, immediately instituted a single late-night strand for both. If you didn't already recognise the music, then quite frankly, shame on you. You need to go out right now and buy Kind of Blue. Seriously, do it. It's not like you need to stop listening to me. Just open up Amazon in another tab and buy it. Now. It is, of course, a special arrangement of So What by Miles Davis. Meanwhile, north of the border, Scottish have by now dropped 
through the night in favour of an even more tautological name for their service. Welcome to Scottish Nighttime Programmes. I told you they were rich. They could afford a black cat with eyes. And that was how the night looked across most of the country. Until 1995. Now we go over to the studios of ITN for the latest national and international news headlines. On January 1st, 1995, Carlton introduced their new nighttime service. LWT followed a month later. They were the co-sponsors of the whole thing after all. Finally, in July, the cat was put out for good as Granada Nighttime from Manchester ended after seven years. Well, actually, it had already ended in January. They just kept the presentation going for a bit while they made the replacement ready for national service. And that replacement involved some of the most fascinating presentation of the 1990s. What you've been looking at for the past couple of minutes is the IDENT. And what you won't have noticed is a single logo on any of them. At this point, just two years into the post-Thames, post-TSW, post-Joy era, people still had some kind of attachment to their regional channels. And it would take time for Granada, Carlton and company to deal with that. Erosion is, after all, a gradual process. Hence, when Carlton pitched the new ITV Nighttime, which was intended from the outset to run nationally, they decided to leave off any branding whatsoever, so the viewer wasn't discomforted by having his channel replaced with a giant forbidding ITV. But at the same time, the strand was still clearly delineated. Creating a brand the entire network could use, or more accurately, have imposed upon them, without having to change anything. Like the earlier Thames LWT service, with which it shared the official name ITV Nighttime, although this never appeared on screen, the new vaguely acid house late night strand was produced from London, this time by LNN, the joint subsidiary of Carlton and LWT that provided their regional news programming. Eventually these ambient, dancey idents were the signifiers of late night almost everywhere in the country. Almost everywhere. Scottish predictably demurred on the imposition of a schedule from London of all places, even, as I've said, at three in the morning, preferring to stick with what eventually became known as Nighttime TV, which spread to Grampian upon the one's acquisition of the other. As for England, the rebels were led by Meridian, of all people, who preferred to create and transmit their own service from schedule to presentation and call it Night Time, because seriously there aren't that many names. This service was shared initially with Anglia and Channel, with HTV in West Country defecting from the London service from 1996, albeit just taking the programming, not the presentation. Around the same time, end of 95, start of 96, the London service tried for a major brand repositioning, which is a frankly unforgivable way of saying that they gave it a new slogan and a promotional push. Unfortunately, This is the most happening hideaway in the world. Yes. You are a disgrace. Make sure you're turned on. Moussa. Did you go all the way? Now keep the knickers on. <laughs> Why did you? Television with Attitude, starting next week. It was a bit crap. Even in 1995, the phrase, with attitude, was essentially code for, hey, 14 to 25 year old demographic, we hate you, we hate you so very much. Buy some shit. But of course, Carlton never let being rubbish dissuade them from anything. The one thing they couldn't ride out was the scandal over Hotel Babylon. Hotel Babylon was a fairly standard, painfully self-conscious and desperately ironic late-night zoo format to spare fest, hosted by Danny Bear and funded by Heineken. 
that's funded by, as in a couple of steps beyond, sponsored by. In what's still a relative rarity in British television, it meant that Heineken had direct contact with the producer, in this case Bob Geldof of all people. And when one of their memos to Geldof was leaked to the press, it kicked up such a storm, it practically ended the show then and there. Because what they said was A, they'd rather see more of their beer in the show, and B, they'd rather see fewer black people in the show. And that's the kind of thing a programme can't really survive, even if anyone had been watching the damn thing, which they weren't. And since Hotel Babylon was the linchpin of the whole TV with attitude approach, well, that went down with it. Meanwhile, by 1998, Meridian Service had become The Edge, which, if nothing else, is an original name. But by now, even the BBC was on 24 hours a day, albeit with rolling news and all the open university. The novelty had well and truly worn off. It was becoming harder and harder to justify the effort. In 1998, ITV introduced Night Screen, eating up the last hour and a half or so between the repeat of Vanessa and GMTV with a sort of pages from PowerPoint. Except for the first year when it was pages from Teletext and therefore even less remarkable. This is basically how it looks when a TV channel throws in the towel altogether. Being explicitly and unambiguously filler, Night Screen was really the first clue that the jig was up for late night TV as a concept worth worrying about. Charlie Brooker once described it as akin to being trapped in a service station watching the in-house information channel going around and around, which is quite accurate and gave me the brilliant idea of keeping a poorly cooked gammon steak on my bedside cabinet every night in case of insomnia. If I wake up at four o'clock in the morning, I could just turn on ITV, nibble warily at the steak, and pretend I'm in motorway limbo. I find this oddly comforting. In 1999, all of the ITV regions became one in presentation terms, and with that, nighttime branding of any sort was phased out. The Edge had already blunted to this unique yet generic look, later updated when ITV traded down before finally joining the rest of the country at the turn of the century and giving up altogether and just throwing generic ITV logos floating in space with pre-recorded announcements. And that's basically where the story ends. Nighttime television is no longer such an astonishing concept that it needs to be branded. And ratings-wise, it's essentially the dead zone it always was. These days, most of ITV's late-night schedule is taken up by signed repeats of Loose Women and Jeremy Bloody Kyle. And this bullshit. So good evening to you. I'm Carrie Watson. Good to be back. Good to have you with me tonight. I'm going to be with you for the next hour and a half. Let's have a good... If you've got nothing to broadcast, don't broadcast anything. Or broadcast night screen. Which amounts to the same thing. The spirit of Night Network lived on the longest amongst those old rebels, the Scots, who still have, essentially, their own channel. Their nighttime TV lasted until 2006, and then in April of 2010, STV launched The Night Shift. <laughs> This consisted largely of a dreamlike tapestry of postcard shots of Scotland, text images from insomniac viewers, the occasional faintly nightmarish studio segment, cats, and of course they, they, they're like a glass of champagne, they're wonderful. I think men love seeing women in hats, they look so sexy in them. And, and bits and pieces of STV programmes, weaving in and out of the hole without much regard to rhythm or sense. But, in the end, even they gave up. Just three weeks before this episode was recorded, the last episode of The Night Shift went out. And um, some pheasants. God knows what they have up there now. Probably that roulette bollocks, Night Screen and Kyle, like everyone else. But then if you're up that late and don't have to be, 
Maybe that's all you deserve. Night time. And as we say goodnight, a quick reminder, if you can still hear me, your set is not switched off properly. Do that immediately, please, and don't forget, pull that plug out of the screen. <laughs>